a customer, there is no causality, right? What are his preferences? He likes this music, that music, this food, that food. What is he sensitive to? Sometimes there is no causality. This is the zero of a causality, right? Now we'll talk about different notions of causality. So one causality notion is what, what we call multi-factor causality. So if you think about medical diagnosis, a disease can have many, many causes, right? It could be caused by either nutrition deficiency, genetic disorder, communicable diseases, uh, uh, seasonal, what have you. Uh, and this is a horizontal, right? I can think about a call drop in a telecom network that can happen because of multiple reasons, whether it's a device problem, there is too much clutter, there's too much load on the tower, there is no cell towers nearby, or there are too many cell towers nearby, the phone is confused which one to connect to, right? So the, the, the job of a data scientist is to not start with data, but to think about these ideas. What am I trying to predict? What are the causal factors of it? Therefore, what data I need? Right? We, we, we don't start with where is the data and all that. We start with what am I trying to predict and work backwards and think about these causal structures. Another notion of causality is cumulative causality. Right? How much supply of a cab, how much demand of a cab is going to be needed in a particular location in a particular 15 minutes. So the demand could be a cumulative of, not one of, cumulative of multiple factors. Right? Is there a stadium event going on? Is there a weather problem that people need more cabs than autos, right? Uh, uh, is it a commute time? Is a competitor doing something that my demand is low? Am I running a campaign that my demand is high? So demand forecasting, one of the most fundamental things, has to be thought very, very holistically about, and similarly, supply optimization and supply understanding, right? Supply of a cab in a location, how do we think about that? It is, again, a multi-causal cumulative, cumulative. So these are all regression models you can think about. And we start with the most important and then keep adding, keep adding till we get it very, very accurate, right? Another notion of causality is what we call dependent space causality. So imagine we are building a education system which is really, really personalized and curriculum personalization is one of our themes. So now imagine a student A apps, uh, opens his digital school and he sees that, hey, I am doing very well in concept P medium in Q and very bad in R, what are you going to recommend me today? The app should say you can either study concept X or concept Q, but let me go back and see why you are failing in concept R. I can go back in this dependence-based causality structure among concepts and figure out exactly that you are struggling with minus of minus and you are in 12th grade and nobody paid attention to that, right? So, so now we can create these kind of causal structures based on a lot of domain knowledge as part of the, of the system, right? Another kind of causality is temporal causality. If you think about events causing other events, right? So when will a person buy a cartridge? Depends on when did he buy a printer, right? And, and if you are into retail, there are lots of such causal structures you can figure out based on that, right? Repeat purchase of, you know, perishables and all of that, depending on family size and all of that. So there's a lot of event causing other events that happens, right? This happens in... Fitbit events for, for medical e events, it happens in drought leading to a certain price rise. So there are events causing other events, right? And sometimes, uh, uh, you know, in agriculture, for example, when did you sow leads to when, when will you harvest? And this is a very important date that matters, and it's a function of how did you do your farming, what was the soil type, and all of that, yeah? And sometimes things are just seasonal. There is no cause from an event perspective, it's just because it is seasonal, back to school, back to whatever, and back to work, uh, we are going to buy pants again, right, or something like that. All right, so now we have structural causality. This is a very important kind of causality. In a complex system, like a refinery, there are many, many working parts that are connected to each other, right? As a domain expert, in that domain, we have to transfer that and understand these architectural diagrams, and then if something is failing, are about to fail, we ask two questions. One is, why is this failing? What is causing this to fail? And the second question is, if this fails, what will it cause other things to fail, right? So in a structural causality, we don't think of cause and effect as a bipartite graph. We think of it as a DAG. We say, this can cause something, and this leads to something else, right? And the same thing applies to any complex system. If you look at a human body and say, why, well, you know, you have a liver problem, if liver is failing, why is the liver failing? And if liver is failing, what else is going to fail, right? So we think of 
Same thing being a cause as well as an effect, right? Once we know the structure of the dependence. Now, this slide is very important. Uh, so here, we, we are trying to build a notion of deep causality. I talked about there are many, many metrics at play, and understanding the causality among the metrics is a very important skill set to have for a future AI architect for complex systems, right? So here's an example. Imagine we work at Ola Uber, and we say, here is the incentives we are giving to the drivers. Here are the offers we are giving to customers. This is my organic demand. What can, you know, what does this affect? So this affects the supply and demand of cabs and, and uh, consumers in the city. And then we say, what does this affect? Then we say, this affects, you know, whether we're going to have stockouts, people are not getting cabs, whether the price will go up because the demand is higher than supply, or if the supply is higher than demand, the, your utilization is very low, cabs are sitting idle, right? What will this affect? And then we talk about whether conversion is going to happen because prices are too high, customer experience is going to suffer, customer engagement will suffer, uh, you know, efficiency of your overall platform will suffer if there's a big gap between supply and demand in different parts of the city. Then what does this lead to? And then we say, oh, this leads to my ARPU and churn and revenue and cost and all of that. And then what does this lead to, right? And uh, maybe your market share and your profitability. Now, to me, the most important skill of a future data scientist is not to be able to build and deploy models anymore. Data IQ and other platforms have taken care of that, right? What is the real skill of a data scientist who is going to build a complex system like that? The first thing is you should be able to work backwards from metrics. You should know the causal structure of metrics in any business because you're building a complex system, right? If your operations are not good, your customer experience is bad. If you cannot solve customer experience in isolation without working on your operations. So we need a holistic view of the whole system, not a very siloed view of the model I am interested in building. We understand? We know how to build cells and tissues. We don't know how to put together a body now. That's the next skill. And I want to translate, you know, data scientists are going to become, evolve into what we call AI architects. Like you have IT architects, this is a notion of AI architects of the future. All right, so once we know causality, now we'll do prediction because I can do causality. Uh, so now the prediction is about taking the causal variables and the effect variable and saying this is the input, this is the output. Can I actually quantify how much of this leads to how much of that, right? And with a lot of data, we can build prediction models. We all know how to do it. I'll talk about four things now, which is what is a prediction framework in general? And why do companies do prediction? There are only three reasons why companies do prediction. Yeah? So the framework is very straightforward. You have events happening on a timeline. Remember, this is not interpretation. Interpretation means the data just came. I need to give it a high-level class label. This is not about that. This is about a timeline of data coming in. This could be banking transactions, and you're trying to predict the EMI failure uh, of payment. This could be uh, Fitbit data or past medical visits and I'm trying to predict a medical event. This could be any of those events trying to predict a future event, right? And what we do, we build a, a lot of features from this part, and then we try to build a model that will predict a future event, right? This can happen in any domain. This is a very generic framework, but there are three very important kinds of reasons why companies build prediction models. The first one is what I call intervention, to predict, to intervene. So when we are predicting a negative event, like churn of a customer, or churn of an employee, or failure of a student in an exam, failure of a crop, right? Any of that, uh, then we are trying to predict to intervene and say, what can I do before it happens, right? This is where proactiveness will come. One of the promises of AI is we can do proactive decisions, right? We can prevent bad things from happening. So how do we do that? This is the first reason we build prediction models. The second reason we build prediction models is not to intervene, but to optimize. And the idea is, if I'm predicting a stock value, if I'm predicting a demand forecasting of something, if I'm predicting the yield of production of crops, or if I'm predicting, you know, credit risk of a person, I'm, I'm not trying to intervene. I'm not saying, how do I improve your credit score? That's not my job as a banker. My job is to optimize how much loan should I give you, right? So same thing in every domain. So how do we predict? optimize, right? And, and if we think that prediction is the end game, prediction is not the end game, 
Optimization is the end game. Prediction is a building block towards that. The third reason why we do predictions is to personalize everything, right? Will this person like this movie? Will this person buy this product on that time, right? So how do we predict something so that we can build very nice ad engines, campaigns, cross-sell, upsell, what kind of models we want to do, right? Can we personalize education and can a student solve this problem so I can give him now is also prediction, yeah? So we use three reasons why we uh, build prediction models. All right, so now let's move on to the next layer. Now today, prediction is not enough, right? It's not, uh, we are not in a Kaggle world where say, who's going to get the best, most accurate model. Interpretation is becoming more and more important. And the idea is we don't want just to say that, hey, you know, uh, distance is high, time is uh, high. We need to know why. Is it because of velocity? Is it because of height, right? Why is it so is important. So the output of a machine learning or a deep learning model has to be two things. One is the, the label or the thing itself and a reason code. So reason code generation and thinking about how to generate reason codes for everything is going to become a, is already a very important area of research now, right? Now, you know, I wanted to build this model and, and, you know, I had a very nice discussion with our bosses, including Mr. Ambani, and he said, why do you want to build a model that can predict a call drop in a telecom network? You cannot intervene, you cannot optimize, you cannot do anything when a person is about to make a call, you cannot do anything. So why do you want to build a model if you predict? Even then, what is the use? I said, this is the fourth reason that we don't understand why we build prediction model. There is a fourth reason. And that is to understand causality itself. We build prediction models. Yeah? So science says we are discovering causality in a different way. Data science discovers causality in a different way. Yeah? So here we are saying that call A dropped because of a certain other region reasons in a certain part of the city, but call B dropped because of a certain other set of reasons. Why is that important? Because I need to know both have high score in the probability world. In both cases, I cannot take any action in, in real time. Why am I doing this? Because I want to learn why in different times and different parts of the city calls are dropping so that I can understand the root cause analysis, group all the calls that have similar reason codes and say this region needs another cell tower, this region we just need to increase capacity, this region, you know, people are using old phones, we just need to upgrade their firmware, right? So the action that is the ultimate deliverable in data science, not prediction, action is the ultimate deliverable in data science, cannot happen unless you also know the reason code. So therefore explainability is not just for, you know, fairness and transparency and privacy, but also for actionability we need to have explainability, yeah? So really, if you think about prediction, prediction is Y of Fx, but in the future, we are going to do explainability where we say Y comma E, which is the explanation, and it's a function of another explainable model G, which is going to take an input and, and output, yeah? All right, so now we'll pivot into another dimension called controllability. It's a very interesting dimension, and a lot of us don't think about input in this way, right? So now if I take the same set of inputs and I color code them differently, you will start to see. So height, angle, and velocity in this case are controllable variables. I can change them. But gravity, wind speed, and air resistance are not something in my control. I can only observe them. This ability to distinguish between two types of inputs, observable and controllable, is a very important skill that we'll have to think about. When we see variables, it's not like we do feature engineering and we all that, but really we need to think about what variables are controllable and what variables are not, right? So today we think like this. Here is my input, predict, output, but really in the future we need to think like this, which is how many of these variables are controllable, how many are uh, predictable, because this is the foundation of the next three layers that we'll talk about, yeah? So if I put this in math, prediction is y of fx, but now x is broken into o and c, the observable and the control, and in any domain you will see both types of variables. We don't notice them because we are doing a Kaggle competition, our goal is something else, but really there are two types of variables that you can see. I'll show you some examples, right? So if I look at conversion of a campaign, there are two kinds of variables, right? If I look at the preference of a user, I cannot modify that, right? If I look at what the competitor is doing, I can observe but not control it. But what I can control is discount, messaging, 
you know, channel and timing, that I can control, right? So now think about how we are pivoting. We're not just building a, a, a prediction model. We're going to use controllability thinking to say what is the right combination of these control variables to maximize the conversion, right? Because the other two I cannot control, right? Same thing in telecom network. I cannot ask a person to say, hey, you are moving in a car, can you, uh, can you stop and then make a phone call? That is not controllable. That is observable. I can observe that you are moving. I can observe that you are in a certain part of the city, but I cannot control that. I cannot ask you to go out of your house, to go to the roof and then make phone calls. That is only observable, not controllable. What is controllable? Where do I put my Excel tower? Where do I put this and that, right? So how do I you know, improve coverage and reduce uh, interference, right? Now let's talk about controllability deeply, right? So remember we talked about an ecosystem of models that has to work together, right? It's not one machine learning model. We have to come out of that mindset that one model is going to cut it, right? So now think about churn as a problem, let's say in any business in telecom. Why is churn happening? So again, you have behavior of the user, usage of the user, when does he call, how much does he call, data and all of that is not controllable. What is controllable is call drops, can I minimize, call quality, can I improve, throughput of data download, can I improve. Now I say, how do I do that? The control variables that I have depend on another set of models behind that, right? Now, if I say, hey, there is an experience prediction model that tells me that these are the observable variables there and coverage and interference, then what, how do they translate into this? And then how do those translate back into network operations, right? Now, what I'm going to show you is very important way of thinking end to end, right? So here, we're talking about a business metric, which is your customer churn. Then we are talking about customer experience. Then we are talking about operational metrics, right? Good quality, uh, this thing. And then we are talking about operational actions, working backwards, right? So this is the controllability thinking applied to a series of models. The output of some goes as an input to the others. And they all have controllable and, and observable variables. Yeah? Now we go to the next layer. Now we know how to control. Then we can simulate. Let me try to throw the ball at a different velocity. Let me try to throw the ball at a different angle. So now we are in a simulation mindset. And now we can simulate things, right? And simulation is going to become as important or more important than what deep learning is today. Simulation thinking is going to become more and more important because you cannot do your pricing strategy in Ola just by looking at raw data. You have to simulate it and say, if this was my pricing strategy, how will my revenue look like? And uh, I have to simulate it on a large city and then see how it goes, right? So the idea is simulation thinking will become more and more important. We are talking about digital twins and all of that now. So the idea of simulation thinking is you already know what is a control and observable variable. If you take one of the variables and start doing slider on it, right? Because the ultimate goal is to maximize an outcome, not to just predict an outcome, yeah? So now we say, if I do this, what will happen? If I do this, what will happen, yeah? So how do I now apply the same prediction model to the next level and start playing with my sliders and all of that, right? So this gives you our ability to simulate. So controllability is about y is equal to f of observable and controllable. But if I look at simulation is about given a different control variable ci, what is the different output variable yi given a particular observed state, yeah? So how do I simulate control to y relationship is, is simulation. All right, and now I can do deep simulation. I can say things like, hey, if I change the tilt here, how will that affect coverage and interference? And if those are affected, how will that affect call drop and call quality? And if that is affected, then how is the churn affected, right? So we are all very excited about building churn model and saying my job is done, but your job is not done because you have not told me what to do at an operational level, yeah? That is what prevents churn, not more, you know, coupons and stuff, right? So now we are able to do the same thing. We need to understand this path of how do we go from actions to business metrics. Yeah? The next layer is optimization, and we all are doing optimization all the time. You optimize your commutes every day, nothing happens, we still get late. Uh, but now imagine you have to optimize, right? I want to maximize the distance, I want to maximize the height. What should be my angle and velocity? So I maximize certain things, right? And this is a very important next layer. So now the question is, I want to maximize my conversion rate. 
and maximization works in a reverse way. It's kind of an inverse function. Yeah. So here we are not saying, given the input, I'm able to predict the output. Here we are solving a different problem. Here we are saying, I want to maximize conversion rate. Tell me what should I do with my control variables? So the, the equation there is C star is really an inverse of, you know, X and Y. So X is your O, O and Y. O is your observed variable, which is a constant. And now you are saying, I want to maximize this. What should be my control variable? So control system thinking has to come. Otherwise, AI will remain a prediction system forever. We will not automate the explanation and control systems. That is the end game. Yeah? Uh, so now we can do deep control. And, and just uh, you know, look at the arrows. Arrows are pointing backwards now. right? So here we are saying, I want to minimize churn. What should I do? That is the question. I don't want to predict churn. I want to minimize churn. Then I should increase you know, call quality and, and minimize call drop. What should I do? So the next model goes back. So this is your new back propagation, if you will, across models. And now you are doing reason code backward forward and optimizing backward forward. Yeah? The last layer is our adaptation layer. And, and really, adaptation is about re-optimization. Yeah? Adaptation is about re-optimization. So now, imagine this system. And uh, we already have this, and we have mastered optimization on it. But suddenly, what happened? The customer preferences have changed. Now, the observed variable has changed. You have only observed. You have not caused the change. You have observed that the customer has got married. He's buying a different set of products now, right? Or you know, the competitor has changed his pricing strategy. You can only observe. What do you do? You cannot have the same optimization model work now, because your input variable, the O's, have changed. So what do we do? We now re-optimize based on how the O's have changed. Yeah? So that is the ultimate holy grail. Can you build a continuously optimizing system, uh, uh, adapting system all the time? Right? So here is how we will describe these uh, five, six things. Prediction is Y of FX. That's what we know how to do. But now we are going to do X is equal to O and C. How do we think about uh, this? Then simulation is about what are the different C's that lead to different Y's for a given O. And then optimization is the inverse problem, which is what is the optimal control for a given uh, Y that I really want, and then what should be my for a given optimization variables. And adaptation is can I do this again and again, right? So every day, every morning, every evening, can I change the tilts of my cell tower because the demand is different, right? Demand forecasting is observed. Control variable says change these tilts this way so that everybody gets a good experience, yeah? So how can we build these kind of systems? So the idea is now, imagine if location, I added new cell towers in the city, or uh, you know, the network load in the morning is different than evening in a certain part, or the usage pattern of people have changed. There is a new TikTok in town, and everybody's downloading a lot of videos. If things change, how do I re-optimize the whole thing backwards and, and uh, get back to it, right? So a continuously adapting complex system is the goal of AI in the next 20 years. Yeah? So that's where we need to be. And hopefully these layers, now you understand how each layer builds on top of each other. And we really need to think about all of those layers to get a system like that going. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.